Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, delegates and participants, dear colleagues, a very good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone, and welcome to the seventh issue of the FAO in Geneva Nutrition Dialogue Series. This year, the series will be focusing on actions to address major obstacles to the advancement of agri-food systems transformation for LSD diets, jointly organized with the Food and Nutrition Division and in collaboration with the FAO office in Brussels. My name is Dominique Bourgeon and I'm the director of the FAO liaison office in Geneva and I will be your moderator uh, today. Before starting our event, allow me to share uh, some of the usual details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session. Uh, this webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be later available on our uh, website along with the various res related resources relevant to this session. It is scheduled to last for about one hour and 30 minutes. We have reserved some time toward the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. And we ask you to please submit your question in the Q&A module. And then we'll try to do our best to, to answer as many questions as possible, either in writing, and this is a call to the panelists to, to monitor the, the Q&A module and, and answer some of the questions in writing or orally uh, during the webinar. So that's all for the housekeeping. And I would like to, to take a, a moment to briefly introduce our speakers today. Uh, we are honored and pleased to have uh, with us today a number of distinguished speakers who will be intervening on the topic of advancing human and planetary health, enabling healthy diets and mitigating climate change. And to that end, we will hear from Dr. Naima al Khasir. Um, WHO representative uh, in Egypt, uh, Dr. Nancy Aburto, Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division at FAO Headquarters, Ms. Penfero Shawinga, Nutrition Specialist from Malawi, Ms. Tanaza Sadaf, Portfolio Lead of GAIN Pakistan, Ms. Vivian Madweke, Climate and Health Program Coordinator of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, Dr. Sisei Sanamo, Senior Program Manager Ministry of, at the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. And finally, Dr. Luz Maria de Regil, Head of Multisectoral Action in the Food System Unit of WHO. So uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And I look forward for a productive uh, discussion. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, before moving to our distinguished speakers, I would like to briefly introduce the topic of today's discussion. The production of today's diet is, as you know, putting significant strain on agri-food system, compromising the stability and resilience of natural resources and biodiverse ecosystem and contributing to climate change. You all know the, the statistics, for example, we know that it is responsible for one third of global greenhouse gas emission, 80% of deforestation, and 70% of freshwater use, uh, use. And it is a main source of terrestrial biodiversity loss. Among the suggested action to effectively address climate change and reduce agri-food system environmental footprint, a shift towards healthy diet is considered central. In response, the, go the government of Egypt, as president of COP27, in partnership with WHO, FAO, UN Nutrition, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition Gain, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement and EAT, launched the initiative on climate action and nutrition, so-called ICANN which aims to create a strong alliance between the nutrition and climate communities to implement policy action that simultaneously improve nutrition outcomes and support climate change mitigation and adaptation. Building on the ICANN, today we will share experiences from Malawi and Pakistan, highlighting practical examples 
across agri-food systems that can simultaneously accelerate progress on climate change mitigation and nutrition. We'll then hear insights from Ethiopia on pressing issues such as drought, floods, and other climate sh shocks, and how these events influence national policies on food system and healthy diets. We'll now start with our speaker, and I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Naima al ghassir uh, WHO representative to Egypt. Uh, Dr. al ghassir uh, will start with setting the scene for our discussion today, linking the healthy diet and climate change nexus under the framework of the Initiative on Climate Action and Nutrition, ICANN. Dr. al ghassir dear Naima, uh, you have the floor. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, Mr. Dr. Baron, can I uh, just to, would like to share my uh, slide, if possible? Uh, we tested it. Now I don't have. I first of all, I would by by the time I'm trying to fix this, I would like to bring our thanks as World Health Organization to be partners with uh, many of you, especially FAO in this very vital area of work and being invited to the Nutrition Dialogue Series. I am trying to find my share. Uh, it's not working. Would if you, you, like want, to if you want, uh, yeah. Dr. al Ghassir, we can share the, the, the presentation yeah, on your just, behalf. Okay, okay, okay. So we will do that. Now. Okay, so now. here it is, here it is. Okay, it's from me, from my side or your side? So I know the control. Mm, okay. Try, try to I'm very it. pleased. I'm very pleased and honored to be here today. As you rightly said, uh, uh, Dr. Dominique, that we are having a challenge and the call for action is yet to be scaled up. However, loads of opportunities and loads of positive energy lately to respond to the complexity of this climate change. And I'm very glad that I have my co colleague Nancy from FAO with me also complimenting, setting the scene, linking our advocacy to actions for initiatives on climate action and nutrition. Today, we know that more than 40% of our populations are vulnerable. They are women, they are children, they are um, refugees, migrants, and this is something that we would like to really look on how to address the complexity of these challenges. And it alludes to our behaviors also. This is something that I think more and more is coming, that we do have some statistics that shows that how we are impacted. Today, I mentioned about more than 30% of the world's population are vulnerable, but at the same time, we know that we are having to more than 100 million additional people getting into extreme poverty by 2030. So we have the poverty angle, but at the same time we are having, like for example, the premature deaths, 250,000 additional premature deaths per year by 2050. If we combine these two, and we are talking about saving lives, but at the same time we are talking about healthy lives for everyone, regardless of the age, regardless of the color, with lens of equity, to ensure that the development is there to ensure that we are meeting sustainable development goals, and at the same time, to ensure that the economies are working. What's happening today also, we are having over 30% of our population are having micro, we have micro deficient population. Over 825, 28 million people are undernourished. So malnutrition is becoming big and big, and the complexity of our words not only of the impact of the climate change on the people, but also of the people's behavior on the climate. Two billion people are affected of micro, micronutrients deficiencies, which I mentioned 30%. 676 million people are obese. And today we know obesity and the nutritional style and dietary styles that we have is one of the major causes that brings, the, because of our nutrition intakes, and leads to the non-communicable diseases. And an underlying cause in nearly half of all the deaths under children of five caused by malnutrition also. So if I, if I go to the next slide, 
I think the control is with you. Or is it with me? Okay. Now this is what uh, already the, uh, the introduction was mentioned by uh, by Dr. Dominique in terms of the what are we doing pushing the climate change to linkages and bidirectional between both nutrition and climate change. Food production has been very clear that we are having an issue on the food production due to levels of nutrition in the crop affecting both human consumption and the feed of animals that we need to see the linkages between one health, human health, animal health, the planet, and at the same time, the environment and water. Heat stress is affecting the animal production. It is affecting the fishing, the, the cooling system, affecting the fish that migrates from one place to another. But also we are having availability and affordability of healthy diets has become as an issue. And how can we really look into ensuring that the health food, healthy food and safe food are available? The weather has affected an increased loss and decreased price stability of the food. And that is, if we know that there is a heat desertification in many countries, it's affecting food availability. But at the same time, the corpse will be affected. More than 40% of the world's caloric intake comes from just three crops, rice, wheat, and maize. I'm sure Nancy will be speaking more about them also. Less diversity and availability of the food means less resilience to climate change. And at the same time, more, of, more to the uh, object to the uh, subjected to be having diseases. The water sanitation and hygiene is now becoming much more critical also in how we are handling of all uh, angle in terms of the agriculture, but also in terms of our behavior. I mentioned already about the increased droughts and how we need to really look into the burden of the disease, access to the clean water, but at the same time, the impact on our nutritional status. The food safety, increased risk and intensity of the foodborne diseases. We know that the higher temperature is affecting the food safety, increased hygiene risks in the storage and distribution. There's WHO and FAO yearly, we have this celebration, and we are talking about food from the, from the harvest or from the, once we plant it to the table that we eat. And in, ter in terms of that, it means how we are behaving as individuals, communities, and institution to really make sure the food is safe and not affecting the human being or the animals. The economic and political st stability has really shown more and more that it brings the, it's affecting the food security and also for us, we are talking about the health security. And this is something that's been seen with the current situation globally. The next slide is actually going to talk about how can we really look into the ICANN and that's the whole thing. We are very proud that we came together as different stakeholders, United Nations, and I'm very pleased with the partnership with the FAO to really put the agenda with the Egypt COP presidency 27 to really make sure we have multi-sector, multi-discipline, and at the same time that now we have a program of the global flagship. Leveraging not a new things, but actually building on the current initiatives, but at the same time, bringing more attention to the global system transformation. We are contributing through initiatives of climate action for nutrition to SDG2, SDG3, and at the same time, I'm actually putting more, the gender equity at this water and definitely universal health coverage beside the zero hunger that I already mentioned. The co-leadership of now currently between WHO and, and, and uh, Egypt government, especially with the COP presidency and Ministry of Health, uh, we are talking about our key partners. I already mentioned FAO. I would like to recognize GAIN. GAIN has been a very uh, active in, uh, in partner with us, with the UN agencies, besides scaling up nutrition, UN nutrition, which is very active group, and EAT. It was launched on the in Sharm el Sheikh during COP27. I mean, the ICANN was launched. Adaptation Agriculture Thematic Day at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. During the day of celebration, I will maybe repeating myself, Adaptation Agriculture Thematic Day. Next, please. 
Now, we are, what do we want to do? We know that the climate change is impacting food diets, as I said, health, healthy and the access to the social protection. But at the same time, we are looking in terms of what can we do? As I mentioned, we, our aim is to achieve being catalyst, mobilizing, connecting different initiatives, advocating, scaling up the advocacy, and at the same time, engaging. And we focused a lot on the youth, women, the people who are having a voice, and at the same time, disabled to ensure that integration and, and nutrition climate action is actually integrated into most of the policies. How do, how well do this, how well we do this? Through articulating a common compelling narrative around climate and nutrition. This is something that we see more and more our partners come around and say it. At the same time, we are looking at the building a stronger alliances across all the entities for the nutrition and the climate communities. And I'm very glad to hear that today we do have environmentalists with us and we are, we are having people who are also not only nutrition background, but also systems background and the other disciplines. To develop and share evidence based on integrated nutrition and climate action and strengthening existing efforts to take action to address the gaps. And we know the gaps, where are they? And I would like to bring, next please, since we are talking about the access, uh, the gaps, we also need to, to bring always, we are looking at not only at the central level, but also at the local communities, at the people that who are the heart of the, of the, uh, the whole purpose of the bi-directional relationship between nutrition and the climate change. When we address these priorities that I mentioned already, we are hoping to accelerate our progress. I already mentioned the poor, poor uh, engagement, uh, the being a catalyst and at the same time being advocate. What are some activities that we are looking at? We are looking at drafting, uh, refining and amplifying the narrative, which would be shared. And we hope that on 2nd of May consultation, more engagement between now and then should be there around climate and nutrition action. We look as partners to strengthen nutrition and climate relationships that we have in terms of really to address how can we mitigate, how can we have more climate friendly environment, how can we reduce the unnecessary loss, and how can we be contributing to the reduction of the greenhouse gases emissions that's affecting the climate change. The, uh, the uh, in, uh, integrating initial I can with UNF C and COP processes. Already I can say that UAE, which is going to be COP28, has already taken actions and moving forward. Establishing baseline for outcomes linking nutrition and climate change. And I have been, uh, been privileged to be listening to many nutritionists the past year, we're working toward COP27 with very much dedicated that we do need to have a consistency on the baseline. And again, I would like to recognize our partners like Gaines, EAT, and, and others, Sun, for example, that were very active. Identifying and sharing best practices, community of practices. I know that we, there are different entities have started. Identi I developed targets for nutrition and climate action. We already have targets. However, how can we refine it? How can we define it? how we can operationalize it and at the same time meet the goal of sustainable development goals. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to share with you, for example, prior to COP26, the uh, greenhouse uh, the, uh, emissions in 2020, it was associated in terms of, uh, sorry, I'm, I am, uh, okay. It is. It was calculated that it's in order to, to implement the national determinant contribution, the, the and uh, prior to COP26, it was announced that climate change is predicted to cost more than 178 trillion US dollars. I'm talking about the negative impact of climate change and how can we address this? And finally, identifying gaps and facilitating new action to address. Today, we are having so many people around, and I'm sure each one of the and individuals here have some experiences to share, and we are very happy to hear the, the case studies that will be presented by the panelists. Can I go to next, please? I think these are my two slides, last two slides. Yes, now, high level, high level uh, impact that we are talking about is 
timeline that we have between now, COP27 to COP28. We have had good experience, good support already when it was launched. Prior even to launch the regional countries in the region, for example, Pakistan is on board, supported the ICANN. And now what we are doing, we are, I already mentioned to articulate the narratives, which we are doing now, to publish a report outlining the current situation in climate and nutrition action established baselines for key outcomes by COP28, develop targets on to outline what can be done to advance climate. And we are looking at out of the box based on evidence, based on research, research and uh, uh, evidence that's coming from the work that everybody's doing on the ground. How to strengthen the nutrition and climate partnerships, engaging member states and non-state actors. This has already started, like for example, through this webinar. I understand there are permanent missions on the line, but at the same time, we are going to move forward to have the hopefully on 2nd of May a discussion, World Health Assembly where may member states are actually the governing member states are making a decision and to share a report on a pathway for better nutrition and better climate actions, referencing existing efforts and best practices. That's another outcome that the, we would, all of us are ambitious to have it by COP28, which will be held at United Arab Emirates. Begin facilitating new action to address gaps identified. Today, right before this session, I had another call with the, the co-chair of the Alliance for Transformative Action for Health, who is Egyptian and who is actually senior official and actually the focal point for the ICANN to inform him about this and to encourage them to listen so we can really move the agenda. Right after WHO, there are a series of conferences like the FAO uh, conference in July, the UNFCCC in the stock, uh, stock taking, and FAO Geneva dialogue again in 2023 September, and CF's October 2023. And hopefully, we all be seeing each other and you and at UNFCCC. I would like to mention I don't know whether my last slide is there or this is the last slide, but just to bring the message that we are here, all of us together to really work towards refining and amplifying our narratives, strengthening nutrition and climate part partnership, partnerships we have learned a lot. And I want to really appreciate that over a short period of time, because of the well, because of the very effective entities available, we managed to put with the COP presidency 27 to put this initiative. And I'm very pleased that it has been taken also by the biodiversity conference uh, last, held last, uh, last year in Canada. So we'll work together and we are committed as World Health Organization. I know Nancy is going to be complementing more in terms of the systems between the water, between the food, between the nutrition and the climate change. And I would leave it to her, including not to have waste that is going on to prevent hunger, but healthier people and healthier lives. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neyma, for for your excellent intervention and for reminding us of the inextricable linkages between climate change and nutrition, and for introducing the ICANN initiative and, in particular, the next steps uh, towards uh, COP28. Thank you very much for that. And we'll now hear from uh, Dr. Nancy Aburto, as you announced already, the Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division at FAO Headquarters. Uh, Nancy will speak about the pathways through which uh, climate and nutrition are interconnected and integrated uh, action for agri -food, from agri-food systems. Uh, Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dominique. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, guests, colleagues, it's really a great pleasure to be joining you this afternoon and especially being able to speak with Dr. Naima. She said some kind words about her appreciation for our partnership. And really um, from an FAO perspective, we're just so pleased to be working with WHO on this important initiative. So I'm gonna take the next few minutes to build off of what Dr. Naima was saying to describe some of the actions that the ICANN really aims to advance for catalyzing sustainable development. So FAO, along with all the partners of the ICANN that Dr. Naima um, discussed, has been exploring the literature on climate nutrition to bring together the evidence that we know about the interlinkages between these two topics. 
We've specifically been looking at the evidence around pathways through which climate and nutrition outcomes can be interconnected so that we can effectively identify those solutions that can both address climate and improve nutrition. Now, we found a wealth of evidence out there about agri-food systems, about water systems, about social protection systems and health systems that show that each of these systems has an impact on, but is also impacted by both climate and good nutrition. So if each of these systems are designed and if they're functioning well with nutrition in mind, they will result in affordable and accessible healthy diets, safe food that's free of pathogens and toxins that can cause disease, clean water that's efficiently managed in order to provide sufficient amounts for drinking and for food production and for well-functioning sanitation systems and good hygiene. They'll result in enhanced coping strategies, especially those that are protecting and promoting adequate care and services for women and children. And they'll result in less illness overall and early detection and treatment for illness when it does occur. And all of these outputs are in, ingredients that are absolutely fundamental for good nutrition. And if each of these systems likewise are designed and managed in a climate smart way, they can significantly reduce those greenhouse gas emissions we've been talking about, protect biodiversity, preserve natural resources, and reduce maladaptation and negative coping strategies. That means that each of these systems has the potential to mitigate climate change. But there are also numerous ways that each of these systems can be maintained to, to function in a robust way in the face of the reality of today, which is we are already experiencing climate change. And this is through integrated management that is adaptive, adaptive to increasing temperatures and to climate induced stresses and extreme events. And these positive impacts on both climate and nutrition can result in a virtuous cycle, a virtuous cycle of healthy people, stronger communities, stronger economies that are shock resistant and therefore able to drive inclusive sustainable development. And Dr. Naima was talking about the sustainable development goals and we see the real potential for this virtuous cycle to help us drive forward the entire Agenda 2030. Now the evidence shows numerous specific actions through which these systems can exert their positive impact on both nutrition and on climate simultaneously. And here I've listed just some of them and you'll be receiving the slides and you can look at this. Um, as Naima was uh, noting before the COP28, we'll be publishing some reports that will provide more detail on some of the examples I'm giving today. But because today we're focusing on healthy diet, let me just pull out the agri-food systems and dive a little bit deeper into actions across that system. Now, agri-food systems include the range of actors in their activities as depicted on this slide, from production systems and even before production systems, those ecosystems that they require, all the way through the consumer, the consumer behavior, how they are consuming food and disposing of food that is responsible for enabling healthy diets for all. And these, this, of course, this healthy diet is that cornerstone of good nutrition that is needed for good health. Now, these systems are highly implicated in improving, in influencing climate change. And Dominique already gave you the statistics, but they're really, really um, overwhelming in a certain way and re worth repeating. And that is that global agri-food systems today are responsible for one third of all greenhouse gas emissions, 80% of deforestation, 70% of freshwater use, and are the single greatest cause of ter terrestrial biodiversity loss. It's really, really impactful, let that sink in. But at the same time, climate change is threatening the existence of the agri-food system and specifically the agri-food system for healthy diets. So for example, we know from the evidence that rising temperatures and atmospheric carbon dioxide reduces crop yields, but it also really importantly reduces levels of nutrients in crops. It reduces the suitability for livestock production and reduces aquatic biodiversity and alters wild fish stocks. So all of that you can imagine results in a reduction 
of a diversity of nutritious foods for healthy diets. Also, severe climate events cause agricultural and food losses, resulting in immediate direct nutrient loss from the food supply, but also resulting in that price instability that Dr. Naima mentioned. And that reduces the affordability of healthy diets. These climate events also increase food safety hazards and they result in the destruction of market infrastructure that can lead to loss of livelihoods, increased cost of foods, and that combination again amplifies the reduction in the affordability and accessibility of healthy diets. And climate variability also leads to negative coping strategies, such as reducing food intake, reducing diet quality, and the implementation of long-term actions that can have negative impacts, such as removing children from schools. Now, our increasing understanding of this interrelationship across the agri-food system of climate and nutrition has helped us to identify specific actions for dual purpose solutions. And this is really the most exciting part of the presentation that I share with you today. There's some examples that I wanna share and there are only a few examples, but I think they're important ones, such as increasing the diversity of crop and animal production and protecting genetic biodiversity, including that of fish and aquaculture species can protect natural resources. It increases the resilience of agri-food system and increases the availability of diverse nutritious foods for healthy diets. And this can be particularly impactful if we truly take a systems approach and we pair this with action on the demand side that accelerates the shift to healthy dietary consumption. Another example, reducing food loss and waste can reduce the amount of land and resources needed for food production reduce inefficient use or, or waste of energy, water, and other inputs for food production, and can reduce methane from organic landfill waste, while also simultaneously increasing the availability of nutritious foods for healthy diets. Now, sustainable healthy soil management is another interesting example. Through reducing agriculture intensification and crop diverse and through crop diversification and other measures, we can have a potent climate mitigation measure because healthy soils can capture and maintain carbon. And these same healthy soils provide nutrients to crops and to the animals that eat those crops and in thus increasing nutrients in our food supply chains. Another example is the implementation of food-based dietary guidelines that include environmental considerations that can guide policy development and behavior change across the entirety of the agri-food system. These food-based dietary guidelines can also help support the alignment of policies. And any alignment of policy across the agri-food system that incorporates biodiversity, climate, nutrition, which right now is, is currently lacking, can really catalyze that mutual reinforcing action for positive benefits for both climate and nutrition outcomes. So our upcoming speakers today are gonna to share some more specific examples that they've been working on in the field. But the ICANN really aims to catalyze, mobilize, connect, and advocate for these types of actions that I've shared and the examples that we're here in just a few minutes and more examples that we're aware are out there today. Examples of actions that have the potential for dual benefit. Another important role of the ICANN is to encourage and support continued evidence generation so that we can learn more about these actions and the potential trade-offs across all of those systems I mentioned earlier and all of these individual actions. We have to recognize that not everything we do will have the same positive benefit on all outcomes of interest and not the same positive benefit in all contexts. But the more that we know, the more easily we can weigh those options, we can mitigate, mitigate the potential risk, and we can make informed decisions for the best possible impacts for addressing national priorities through addressing climate and nutrition outcomes simultaneously. And one last thing we need to do 
is we need to elevate this conversation and link it to financing possibilities so that we can ensure that we can scale these solutions so that we can catalyze action for sustainable development. And with that, I'll close my presentation and thank you all for your time and turn it back over to Dominique. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy, for your very informative and excellent presentation. And it is really fascinating to hear the new findings on systems pathways through which climate and uh, nutrition interact. The agri-food systems, water systems, health systems, and social protection systems. Uh, and you also clearly presented how climate change interacts with the whole agri-food system and its sectors, especially on diet. And I'm sure that, uh, as you said, the, the most interesting part was the slides on the, the, the very concrete uh, integrated actions which you proposed uh, at, at, at the end. And this will resonate very well with the, the case studies and the panel discussion which we will have today. So thank you again, Nancy. And we'll now start with our country case study presentations. And we'll first hear from Ms. Pemfero Shawinga. Uh, nutrition specialist from Malawi will present on the Global Environment Facility Project, Jeff Project in Malawi, on enhancing the resilience of agroecological uh, systems um, project. So, Ms. Shawinga Bemfero, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. And good evening, everyone. I'm Pempelo Jawinga, a nutrition specialist from Blind. I will take you through the climate change and nutrition nexus in ERAS. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the uh, basic project data. And the goal of uh, the project is to prove food and nutrition security of the rural communities in the targeted areas. Uh, okay, you have taken me back to the basic project uh, data. Uh, so the, the name, the previous slide, please. Thank you. The name is Enhancing the Resilience of Agroecological System Project, and it started in 2017 and is uh, expected to end. So the The goal of the project is to improve food and nutritional security of the rural communities and the target, uh, in the targeted areas. The project development objective is to enhance the provision of the ecosystem services and improve the productivity and also improve the resilience of our agricultural system for the vulnerable poor uh, rural people. They are, the specific objectives are one, addressing the land degradation, two, addressing losses of uh, agrobiodiversity, and also uh, addressing climate change adaptation and also mitigation. Next. So there are several components uh, which the, the project is working on. The firstly is catchment, uh, catchment conservation. Uh, so, uh, erosion control investments such as uh, vegetable contour bands and also the gabions for uh, uh, tackling real erosion and also plugging the, the gullies uh, respectively. And these are uh, catchment conservation activities are uh, labor intensive. As such, the project are uh, sort of uh, 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 giving the participants some in, in, uh, some uh, incentives in order for for them to 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 uh, participate fully. So the the farmers are uh, given uh, livestock as in the incentives. Uh, Eraspia has facilitated 
has facilitated the distribution of uh, small stock, which include goats, chickens, ducks, rabbits, and also uh, doves in the hotspot areas. So far, 7,700 for the two farmers have benefited. Uh, the small stocks received to help to, uh, the farmers to uh, ease like say, high quality protein. But apart from that, the, 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 uh, the manure from the uh, small stock will improve the yields, hence improving food security. Next. Under uh, reforestation, ERASP uh, is promoting planting of trees as a mechanism against floods and also mudslide in hilly areas and along the river banks. ERASP in intended to rehabilitate and put under uh, sustainable management 13,065 hectares of land. So far, uh, more farmers are interested to plant fruit trees rather than the ordinary trees because of the multiple benefits of which our uh, uh, fruit trees give. There are these trees include guava, mango, and popo. These are, are grafted trees whereby the farmers are, are, are planting in their fields and are also around the homestead. Uh, more than uh, 10,000 trees have been planted so far. Next slide, please. Uh, as uh, uh, one way of uh, improving, uh, well, as one way of re reducing deforestation, ERASP is also promoting use efficient or use of efficient energy efficient cookstoves. This is helping farmers to manage the available uh, fewer wood that they have, and also as the, the, the fewer wood that they have is taking long uh, for them to use the time that they are saving, the farmers are using, uh, the mothers are using that time to do other uh, activities. For example, they have enough time uh, to care for, for their young ones. And also uh, the mothers, they, 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 they feel uh, comfortable to prepare a number of dishes at household level, hence are improving data diversification. So far, 5,678 households are using these energy efficient cook stops. Next. And under uh, biodiversity, climate change brings droughts and also high uh, intensity rains. For example, this is evident in Malawi this year, whereby other, other areas have received a lot of rains and other areas are receiving uh, 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 have experienced drought. ERASP is promoting production of indigenous crops, which have proven to be drought tolerant and also uh, highly nutritious. These are uh, indigenous crops are uh, supplementing the hybrid uh, varieties which farmers are planting. These include millet, yams, cassava, sweet potato, cow peas, bambara nuts, and pigeon peas. Uh, these ha uh, the ha these uh, crops are helping the households to be food secure uh, in cases of drought. Cooking demonstrations are done on how to utilize the uh, indigenous crops to help the households utilize the, the, the yields better for improved nutrition. Next slide. The midterm survey report has revealed that a minimum dietary diversity for women has improved from 23.2% to 40.7%. And also 65% of the households have reported improved, have reported an improvement on the uh, change, improvement on the dietary patterns. And also the lean months, which the farmers were experiencing will have reduced from six to seven months in a year to at least four months in a year. Now we go to the lessons learned. Next, please. Environmental conservation through catchment management is assisting to preserve the water as the bore was used to dry up, but this time around, they, 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 the boreholes are not drying up. Hence, that's helping the mothers, uh, the, the caregivers, and also the mothers to save time 
which they used to walk long distances to in order to search for water. And that time self they are using to do other activities like, like raising uh, backyard gardens and also taking care of livestock. And also the, the, the scarcity of water was one of the living, uh, limiting factors for the households to have the backyard gardens. But since they have water throughout the year, they are able to have backyard gardens all year round. Nutrition status of the household has also improved uh, and clearly com combined the efforts at community level in protecting the environment through various interventions are having their benefits trickling down to the community where they are benefiting at individual level through increased access to food and also improved uh, improving their nutrition status. Reforestation using uh, tree fruit trees has multiple benefits, and this is encouraging many farmers to plant more trees in their gardens and also uh, around the homestead, hence improving their access to uh, fruits, whereby uh, improving their access to micronutrient-rich uh, foods. Integrated, uh, another lesson is that integrated homestead food production has helped farmers to have access to nutrient dense foods all year round and hence improving their dietary patterns. Lastly, cooking demonstrations and food displays has helped the farmers to diversify their diets better. Next. Next slide, please. The, uh, that's a picture showing farmers planting uh, fruit trees. Next. Next slide. That's one of the farmers who benefited from the ducks and the ducks of money multiplied to the extent that he's selling the, the, the ducks to get other uh, nutritious foods that she can't produce, they can't produce. That's one of the uh, person beneficiaries in Colombia. Next, uh, production of uh, cookstoves in progress, whereby we are promoting both uh, two types, the rocket ones and also the mobile, the mobile boards. That's the few efficient proofs of being adopted by farmers. So you can see that others are opting for the inbuilt ones, the rocket ones, while others are using both the two types of stoves. That's a cooking demonstration in progress, whereby even not during the cooking demonstrations, farmers are, farmers are encouraged to use the energy cook, uh, saving cook stoves. And the last slide, please. That's a cooking demonstration underway, whereby uh, even the, the caregivers are encouraged, are encouraged to bring their children so that they can enjoy that they can enjoy the food that we are uh, they are they are learning. Thank you so much for 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 listening. Well, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Shawinga, for your for your intervention and for being very concrete on the the variety of activities of the Jeff projects you are you are running in Malawi, for example, in terms of catchment conservation, reforestation, but also promoting the use of energy efficient cookstoves, biodiversity conservation, uh, diversification of uh, of livestock production. And, uh, and thanks for highlighting the, the resulting significant uh, impact on nutrition and for uh, drawing some, some lessons. Uh, this is exactly what we are looking for in the context of, of these dialogues. Uh, before I move to uh, uh, Ms. Sadaf, I'd like to remind you that there is a very rich and active uh, discussion ongoing in the Q&A. Uh, and so uh, thanks to our uh, speakers for, for interacting and for our participants to, to engage. Uh, and we'll now hear from Ms. Uh, Tanaza Sadaf, portfolio lead of uh, GAIN uh, Pakistan, will speak about uh, greening the dairy sector in Pakistan. Uh, Tanaza, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tanaza Sadaf, portfolio lead, representing Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And GAIN increasingly seeks 
to advance a joint focus on the environment and the nutrition to successfully alleviate malnutrition in a sustainable manner. One of uh, such projects of gain is towards healthy diets from sustainable food system is greening the dairy sector in Pakistan. So I will share an overview and background of these projects that GAIN is implementing in Pakistan. So uh, uh, all of us know that uh, the climate change and the food system are interdependent and climate change can negatively impact the food system and the food systems play a role in driving the climate change. Uh, in Pakistan, 41% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, uh, including the livestock, which is also a major source of local water and air pollution. So uh, this makes it imperative to prepare for and mitigate the effects of the climate change on food system and vice versa. So GAIN looks at its program using the lens of the environment. Uh, it identifies and promote the innovative technologies that minimize the resource use uh, in food production, processing, and sale. And it also supports the buyers to reduce the food losses and the waste. So having said that, I will share uh, the challenges related to climate change, food insecurity, and malnutrition in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is one of the victims of the climate change, and uh, it is eighth most vulnerable country to climate change, according to the Glo Global Climate Risk Index. And uh, in 2022, it became evident that there was an urgent requirement to enhance the environmental sustainability and resilience when the country was hit by a series of floods. One third of the country was underwater, infrastructure was heavily damaged, more than half of the country's crops were washed away. So it posed a serious threat to the food security and nutrition. It cost about 15 billion USD and damages and the same amount in the economic losses. And the food prices uh, raised up, lost incomes and poverty increased due to the impact of the flood. So the huge loss served as a wake up call for Pakistan to seriously invest in mitigating the climate change and increasing resilience to it. So uh, along with the climate change issue, the Pakistan also faces serious challenges with, when it comes to the malnutrition and ensuring the access to the healthy diets. 37% population of Pakistan is food insecure and it is ranked as 92 among 116 nations on the global hunger index. And uh, it is also one of the highly malnourished country with 40% of the children under five are stunted and 14% of the adult women are underweight. And micronutrient deficiencies are also widespread. A large uh, population is deficient in iron, zinc, vitamin A, and vitamin D. So these alarming facts and figures pressing the need for the country to find ways to simultaneously address malnutrition and climate change. So keeping the background in view, GAIN designed a project for greening the dairy sector in Pakistan. And dairy sector was selected because it is one of the potential areas to work in Pakistan. And the livestock sector alone contributes 12% of Pakistan's GDP. And Pakistan is the, among the leading raw milk producing country. It is ranked fourth in the world with a gross production of 62 billion liters per year. So despite uh, that, it is the uh, fourth largest milk producing country. It could not meet its domestic need and the uh, dairy imports climbed up to uh, US dollars 140 million in 2019. So dairy products are a rich source of macro and micronutrients, including protein, calcium, and vitamin D. And consuming dairy is associated with significantly low rates of the stunting. But at the same time, the dairy sector is also posing a number of environmental challenges, like livestock are a major emitter of greenhouse gas emissions and use considerable amount of land and water. And the impacts are magnified with high level of loss and waste. Waste from dairy sector is considerable and way is one of the ways that can cause serious damage to the local ecosystem. So, uh, this slide is showing the per capita estimated environmental footprints of the current dietary pattern in Pakistan. So you can see here in these graphs, graphs that the dairy sector that is showing in the pink color is contributing um, a large, is play, playing a large role in the per capita greenhouse gas emissions in terms of uh, land use, water use, and EU protection. So dairy thereby provides a critical solution space to act upon these environmental domains in Pakistan. So we, uh, our focus is on the whey water. Whey is one of the byproducts produced by the dairies. 
and generally the 10 liters of the milk is processed to produce one kg of cheese. And during this process, nine to 10 liter of the whey is wasted. So direct disposal of the whey in the environment creates serious pollution problems. And it is one of the strong organic effluents that can pose a risk to the environment if not properly managed. And it also poses direct impact on the quality of the soil and the future perspectives of agriculture produce when drained into the agriculture field. And in Pakistan, the dairy industry is currently producing large amount of whey. It varies from 10,000 liters per day up to more than 100,000 liters per day, which has led to considerable environmental problems due to its high organic matter content. And according to an estimate, about 30% of the total whey produced is exclusively subjected to production of whey powder by a few of the large industry players. Uh, however, the 70% whey water is dispensed to the disposal process through different means. So with potential high environmental cost and representing lost nutritional value and embedded emissions. So to tackle all of these uh, interconnected challenges in view, the project gain access to better dairy greening and scaling project was started in Pakistan by finding opportunities to reduce waste while creating innovative and nutritious and the desirable dairy products for the local population. So a cheese can be made using the pasteurized milk and the cheese making process involves sequential steps uh, like acidification, coagulation, separation of curd, and during one of the process, uh, when the curd is separated, a lot of whey water is produced. Very few dairy companies in Pakistan are converting this whey into the powder form of whey protein. But most of the dairies are wasting this whey and draining it out into the fields or in the sewer system. And few of them are also selling it to the farmers uh, who are using it as a supplement in the fertilizers as well as in the animal feed. So our, we intend this whey water is um, a good source of protein. It is loaded with the nutri um, natural protein. So we intend to repurpose this whey water and bring it back to the food value chain by converting this whey into a affordable, healthy, and nutritious drink. So it will uh, contribute towards reduction in the food waste and positively creating impact on the environment it will also increase the servings for the consumer and it increase the revenues for the processors and the ingredient providers. So the two main objectives of the uh, project, number one is increase acceptability and affordability of safe and nutritious milk-based products. And the second is catalyze the market development of the dairy value chain and increase the profitability of the local processors contribute to, towards SDG2 in terms of uh, achieving the food security and improving nutrition, contributes to SDG8 in terms of sustainable economic growth, and it also contributes to SDG12 in terms of reducing the food waste and uh, contributing positively to the environment. So a sharp approach was uh, devised and used to hit the sweet spot using the competencies of the diverse uh, partners, considering the key constraints like the sustainability, healthfulness, affordability, reliability, and preferability in view. So the partnership brings together private companies, government agencies, civil society organizations, and universities to co-develop the dairy products that are affordable to low-income consumers in Pakistan. So a consortium of partners joined this project like local members of the Sun Business Network. Sun Business Network is a private sector arm of the scaling up nutrition that is primarily comprised of the local food value chain SMEs. So dairy companies joined this project and then the global SPN members, Arla Food Ingredients provides the technical assistance on the product formulation. GAIN provides expertise on the fortification with vitamins and minerals to address the local micronutrient gaps while ensuring a low retail price point per serving. So um, public institutions are also on board to ensure the alignment with the government goals and schools as a channel for distribution were identified and um, um, included in the project to create the opportunities to for packet waste management and recycling. So through the sharp approach, the partnerships develop dairy products that address micronutrient deficiencies while remaining affordable, sustainable, and preferred by the consumers. GAIN also has developed our environment assessment tool to support and empower the GAIN's program greening ambition. It triggers the prog programs to consider 10 environmental impact levers like the environmental compliance, the energy, emissions, land use, et cetera. 
So uh, the tool was also applied to this project and in a co-learning workshop attended by partners, the potential environmental benefits shown here in the green arrows and the risk potential risks shown here in the orange arrows were identified and the mitigation actions were explored and discussed. And these environmental pathways were used to identify areas for mitigation action to help build and monitor the environmental dimension of the sustainable business case and the project narrative. So uh, this is the uh, composition of the wavering that I'm talking about. It is 50% of the fresh whey with 3.5% whey protein powder to increase the protein level. 5% sugar is added for acceptability of the taste, 1.9% cream, 38% fat, then uh, premix of containing vitamin A, D, zinc, and iron, flavors and color, and water to meet 100%. And on the right side, you can see the nutrient and the calculated values of this, this string. Uh, only the value of the fortificant is not mentioned here. So this is the value of the string. So a few of the lessons uh, that we learned from this experience to aid future endeavors in establishing sustainable partnerships that not only enhance access to nourishing food uh, for low income consumers, but also positively impact the environment. Uh, so the project de demonstrated the importance of utilizing waste way here as a resource, not only to reduce the environmental impact, but also to create a new product. So um, the innovation was linked with the uh, revenue generation, new streams, new products that attract the um, attention of the private sector. And then the effective collaborations and the engagement with the relevant stakeholders, public and private sector and consumer is a key to cre create a space and demand for the new product in the market because without the supply chain, uh, the product would not be sustainable. And uh, prospects of viable business case for the involved commercial partner is essential to gain the attraction. And uh, industry um, here in Pakistan consider this waste, the waste as a potential threat to environment. They understand it and, and they are aware of its implications on the agriculture, air and soil. And so there is a lot of potentials to scale up this project in Pakistan. So a few of the next actions that uh, we have planned, several actions uh, to strengthen the environmental dimensions of the project like uh, the percent of waste reduction through this project and its possible impact on the environment, we are um, intent to measure that. And the possibility to recycle the UHD packaging in the institutional settings will be assessed in the um, consumer facing material and the communication with messaging on the environmental sustainability will also be added. Um, another action that is financial business case for the private sector, we are going to develop that to, sh show to showcase the revenue generation by converting waste to value. And um, another action is to create a demand for waste to value approach in the dairy value chain, explaining the triple benefit. Number one is nutrition, second is environment, and the second is business or the revenue generation. So I will conclude my presentation here by saying that the project can contribute to the broader dis discussion on the integrated programming on climate change and nutrition by highlighting the win-win co-developed solution of transforming waste into nutritional value, then a systematic process for analyzing environmental impact of a food value chain in order to identify areas for intervention and collaborative problem solving involving the local private sector players who need to own the solution and integration of high income country private sector experts like Arla Food Infinite here who support the knowledge and the technology transfer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Sada, for your in intervention. For, of course, also for reminding us that Pakistan is among the most vulnerable uh, countries to climate change and its dramatic consequences, as we have seen in, in 2022, in which so many people. Uh, to date have to cope with. Uh, also for highlighting the, the food insecurity situation the country is facing, but also then for uh, presenting the effort made in, in greening the dairy sector, which is uh, one of the major sector in Pakistan and in the world, uh, but which has, of course, uh, environmental costs and nutrition uh, benefits. Uh, solutions, uh, you gain and uh, a variety of partners have co-created uh, to avoid waste, but also to create new products, also drawing, uh, and you have also been drawing uh, lessons on the way forward. So thank you very much for, for this excellent presentation, very informative one. 
And we now hear from uh, Dr. Sisai Sinamo, uh, who is a senior program manager at the Secota, on the Secota uh, Declaration Federal Program uh, Delivery Unit and Sun uh, Focal Person at the Ministry of Health in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, Dr. Sinamo uh, will speak about the case of the Secota Declaration, which aims to aim end uh, stunting in children less than two years uh, in, uh, of less than two years in uh, 2030. Uh, Dr. Sinamo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dominic, for a kind introduction. Uh, I will be uh, speaking on the integrating climate change and nutrition action uh, using a case study from the Sakota Declaration. Next, please. Uh, as you know, Ethiopia has been making a significant progress in terms of improving the socio-economic uh, 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 development. Uh, however, we are still facing uh, a triple uh, burden of malnutrition. And uh, based on the study that was conducted by the Cost of Hunger study uh, back in 2013, uh, Ethiopia loses 65% uh, of the GDP uh, as a result of uh, stunting, uh, which is equivalent to uh, 4.5 billion uh, dollar uh, every year, uh, which is also uh, results into lost workers' uh, productivity, morbidity, mortality, and also poor school performance and uh, school repetition. And we are also cognizant that the uh, most of the the impact uh, from uh, the climate change and vulnerability, uh, and Ethiopia is one of those countries that are vulnerable because our, our economy is also heavily dependent on agriculture. Next. So considering the global climate change and also extreme weather, uh, this is also happening in Ethiopia and this is demonstrated by uh, frequent and intensity of some of the disasters such as drought, rainfall variability, flood and storm, and also recurrent drought, uh, including flooding that is also affects the food production and also lose of some of uh, our staple crops as well as also horticulture and also it affects us uh, it was earlier mentioned in terms of the quality and the quantity of productivity of the livestock uh, it also results into loss of waste uh, wetlands and also associated ecosystem services including the biodiversity and also the incidence of like locust invasion which also results into agricultural productivity and also a significant reduction in water table uh, that is also affects the, uh, the streams, the rivers, the ponds that are used for consumption as well as also irrigation. And at the end of the day, it results into increasing the chronic as well as uh, uh, acute malnutrition through the various mechanisms. Next. So cognizant of that, the government has developed a wide range of policies and strategic documents. We have the food and nutrition policy, the nutrition sensitive agriculture, the food and nutrition strategies, the productive safety net, the school health and nutrition and also hazard uh, policies and programs. Next, that are really enabling us to improve the uh, uh, food and nutrition situation uh, through the climate smart interventions. In the past year also, we went through the food system transformation roadmaps where we developed uh, 22 game-changing solutions under six clusters, including uh, ensuring availability and accessibility of safe and nutritious dense foods, and also promotes the sustainable equitable consumption of healthy, safe and nutrient dense uh, diets throughout the life cycle, and also integrating the policy making systems to promote uh, uh, production and productivity. So among these specifically the cluster three interventions uh, focuses on reducing environmental degradation, uh, integrated landscape watershed management, as well as also the great uh, Greg, uh, the green legacy initiative, which uh, consists of a massive tree planting uh, initiative. Next. The other clusters also uh, address enhancing uh, digital technologies and innovations through the food system and also accessing to market and market information infrastructure and specialization. And of course, the last one is the managing and administering risk and protecting the poor, especially those who are vulnerable to shock, drought, and also disasters. Next. 
So when I come to specifically the Sakota declaration, which is also one of the game changing solutions in the food system transformation, uh, this has been uh, um, uh, unveiled in 2015 with 15 years roadmap divided into three phases. The first phase, we call it the innovation phase, which extends between 2016 and 2020, which is a learning by doing phase we implemented in 40 Varadas. And based on that learning, currently we are in the expansion phase, reaching 240 Varadas, which are a high stunting burden. Varada in Ethiopia case is equivalent to district to other uh, uh, countries. And where 10 sector ministries are working together to address the impact of climate change, specifically in food and nutrition and security, uh, specifically for the quota declaration is for the ending stunting uh, goal. Uh, during the implementation, we have tested uh, six innovations and these innovations has been successful. And now we are scaling up uh, these innovations in 240 Varadas next. Well, as you know, uh, malnutrition uh, work requires a lot of multi-sectoral uh, interventions. And uh, you know, from the Almata Declaration, one of the key recommendations is having uh, multi-sectoral intervention also to address the social determinants of health. So uh, as it was indicated in the Lancet uh, series, uh, you know, the primary health care requires a multi-sectoral intervention. So the work that we are doing through the Sakota Declaration also contributes to the improved uh, health outcome. Next. So research also shows that, you know, the, the, the socioeconomic status, the educational level, as well as also the healthcare uh, uh, service provision and also the social determinants are also the key factors for improving health outcome. So we know we have the, the work that we do through the Sakota Declaration, we are cognizant that, that also it has to improve to, to the sales outcome because it addresses the household food insecurity, the education quality, health care, social, uh, and also economic uh, stability. Thank you. Next. So we did the innovation phase of the Sakota Declaration in Forty Waradas in Tigray and Amhara region, and we have been able to demonstrate a significant reduction in stunting and also prevention of child diseases, as well as also a version of uh, stunting uh, among uh, over 100, nearly 110,000 stunted cases have been averted through the interventions that we did between 2018 and 2021. Uh, and now we have moved to the, the scale up phase, the expansion phase. Next. So the expansion phase currently covers uh, 240 districts, as I have said earlier, uh, close to 28 million people and uh, over 1 million pregnant lactating women and over 2 million children under two with a total investment need of uh, over $1.8 billion. And the government is also making a treasury commitment on annual basis between 10 to 15 million USD to support the expansion phase. As you can see in the map, the geographic distribution is across the, the country and the dots in the map is uh, the, the, the concentration of the stunted you know, cases of children across, across the country. So that is you know, the impact of the climate change as well as also this impact on the nutritional outcome. Next. So in terms of uh, in, in interventions, what are the priority interventions that we are implementing to integrating the climate change uh, into, uh, in clim integrating nutrition into the climate change action? The first one is increasing production, productivity, and consumption of locally available nutrient-dense uh, foods. Uh, the second one is increasing uh, uh, small-scale livestock ownership, including poultry, goat milk, and others. The third one is expanding climate smart irrigation potential to improve uh, water use efficiency and extend, uh, extend growing seasons. And also the fourth one is improving climate resilient water supply quality and quantity in household health facilities and school, which we call it the institutional wash. The fifth one is improving access to hygiene uh, sanitation facilities to have, and also addressing open defecation. The sixth one is uh, improving the the, the delivery of direct nutrition interventions through the, the public uh, uh, health system. 
Environmental and social safeguard and also climate change issues are considered as an integral part of the Sakota Declaration Program. And we consider all of uh, the environmental and social safeguard issues across the various interventions. Next. So in one of our projects, which we are working uh, together with the Africa Development Bank, which we call it the multi-sectoral approach for stunting uh, reduction project. Uh, it has four components, and one of the, the components is the climate proof infrastructure development for effective service delivery. Those service deliveries are through irrigation, health facilities, uh, as well as also water supply, and also the agriculture extension services. So the climate resilient infrastructure constructions that are uh, being implemented under this program of directly mitigating the climate change through reducing the greenhouse uh, emission, uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas emission. For instance, one good example is replacing diesel pump generators used traditionally for water supply scheme. Now we are completely replacing them with solar energy that will completely reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emission. Next. And also to avoid unintentional harm to the people, the physical environment, and also climate resilient infrastructure constructions, we are doing this by conducting site-specific environmental and social risk screening and climate risk screening of all sub-projects that are executed under this project. So whenever we do the water irrigation and also other infrastructure, we do a site-specific environmental and social screening. We conduct water uh, shade management, which also boosting now the water resource provision service from the proposed surrounding ecosystems, for instance, for irrigation and also drinking water supply. We are also conducting a soil and water conservation structure construction uh, of the sub projects, catchment by community contribution. Communities also do, uh, you know, tracing and also other activities so that it can rehabilitate the degra uh, degraded the degraded catchment, which mitigates and also adapts to the changing climate. And also we are also using the water uh, treatment technologies in areas where, uh, you know, surface water or groundwater is not uh, uh, adequately available to provide uh, for the communities using the technologies like the new filtration. Next. Dr. Sinamo, can I please ask you indeed to wrap up quite quickly? Thank you. Yeah, this is my, my last slide. Thank you, uh, Dominic. So in conclusion, uh, the, the government of Ethiopia is committed to address uh, you know, the impact of climate change uh, on nutritional outcomes. And currently the government is leading uh, leadership, providing leadership and coordination for bringing uh, 10 plus sectors to work together to reach the climate change impact uh, impacted communities. And also we are sustaining uh, our commitment to efficiently implement the Sakota Declaration and also protect the national environment and efficiently utilize uh, available natural resources. And also we are also promoting the production access and also consumption of diversified, adequate, healthy, safe and affordable nutrient foods. As you know, Ethiopia is also implementing the Green Legacy, which is a massive uh, tree plantation, which currently overpass the 20 billion target, uh, which also brings opportunity for planting trees to protect the environment, as well as have a nutritional value fruits that links nutrition action to climate change and contribute to food and nutrition security. So using this opportunity, I will also call upon to all our stakeholders to join the government of Ethiopia in scaling up nutrition resilient uh, climate resilient nutrition action. I thank you, over to Dominic. Well, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sinamo. And this is exactly what we are looking for, a very concrete experience, indeed describing the context, the, the, the effect of climate change on the nutritional status situation in uh, Ethiopia and the related policy response by the government. Also, thank you for introducing the, the food system transformation roadmap with a, a special uh, focus, uh, specific focus on the Sekota Declaration and the government of Ethiopia uh, innovative commitment to, to end stunting uh, by 2030 and the related actions uh, you and the government have taken. This is 
This is indeed excellent. Uh, as you can see, colleagues, we have a lot of very informative and, uh, and presentation, informative presentations today. Now, I will give the floor to uh, Vivian uh, Madweke, the Climate and Health Program Coordinator of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, GAF, uh, to facilitate a reflection on the case studies presented. And I think the discussion is so rich that I think would be great if uh, you, the panelists and the attendees could remain, could consider extending a little bit your, your participation in this uh, webinar by say 10, 15 minutes so that we can indeed have some reflection and then move into uh, some final consideration uh, by uh, Luz, our colleague from, uh, from WHO, noting that in parallel to the very rich conversation, there is also a rich exchange in the, in the Q&A module. So uh, over to you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone on the call today. I am Vivian Madwick here, and I represent the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, and we are a strategic alliance of philanthropic foundations. And based on the previous presentations, we acknowledge that food and nutrition or our food systems are impacted by um, climate change, both as a victim, but also as a solution. So we must address climate change in tandem with nutrition um, to, to, to make sure that we get the sustainable development that we are looking for. With that in mind, I would like to um, invite the three uh, most recent speakers. Uh, starting with Dr. Sisse, you pressed, uh, you touched on some of the present issues like droughts, floods, and stunting in the country. And it's it will be interesting for you to share how the country has managed these various trade-offs and priorities, especially with limited resources. So I'm curious to if you can share uh, with us some of the strategies that have been successful with the government, but also some of the challenges that you have experienced with balancing these various priorities. Sise, Dr. Sise with us. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian. Uh, I think in terms of the uh, existing opportunities, uh, the first thing is a policy environment. You know, for a country to be successful and address uh, this kind of challenges, there needs to be a very clear policy that links uh, climate change, nutrition, as well as also the other challenges that uh, we face uh, in the country. So that is number one. The second one is the government ownership and commitment to translate the policies into action. I think policy implementation is very key. For in our case, for instance, we have the food and nutrition policy that is now being translated through the food and nutrition strategy and also the Sakota declaration. That is, you know, going down uh, in the community, and also the government own uh, initiative to finance its own initiative. For instance, the uh, government allocates, you know, even if you know we have a limited resource, but from that resource we are also allocating our own resources from a treasure resource. I think that is uh, another uh, 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 contribution. The other, the other one is the opportunity is the national also initiative. I think the Green Legacy Initiative also giving us an opportunity to plant, you know, uh, fruit trees. You know, that is a huge, massive uh, plantation. So that it also will contribute uh, towards this food and the nutrition uh, initiative. The other is also the global movement. I think, as I have said earlier, the global food system transformation, the ICANN, and also the other global, you know, initiative could really positively advance and contribute uh, to, to this one. I think in terms of the challenges, uh, similar to other countries, Ethiopia is also facing the escalating the food price is one of the, the challenge to address the food and nutrition. Uh, the, the, you know, the droughts, you know, the East African drought is also affecting our country and that is also another thing. Uh, of course, we also went through a difficult period when we went through the, you know, the past two, three years has been a conflict in Ethiopia that is also uh, affecting us. Uh, I think also the uh, unaffordability of healthy diet, you know, LZ, every time, you know, the food price is going up and that is making very difficult for people to afford. Uh, and finally is also the investment that is being available to translate these policies, strategies into action, 
uh, both from national level as well as also global communities investment toward this improved nutrition is, is minimal. So those are a few of the challenges. Thank you, Vivian. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Sise. And I hear you say it's important to have policy environment in place, government ownership, financing and also some of the and also the global movements like ICANN and the food system summit but as well you've reflected on the, the key challenges you faced food prices and um, conflicts and investment i'm curious if you can throw more light on your ndcs i know that the ethiopian government submitted the last ndc in 2021 and given that this year is a global stock take i'm curious to know if there will likely be a, an NDC revision and also will healthy diets be included um, in the NDCs? If you can just briefly in a minute talk about this. Yeah, th thank you so much, Vivian. Last year uh, with uh, co-presidency uh, in Egypt, you know, when we joined that, we have also uh, went there with our position paper on the climate change and uh, nutrition action. So the government has already taken nutrition very seriously during the COP27, and we hope that in the NDCs uh, it will be it will be considered, you know, in, in, the, in the upcoming COP28. We have already has demonstrated a very clear commitment in the past year. Uh, so we are working closely with the team, and we hope that that will happen for COP28. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sisse, as and for sharing that. And as you as he mentioned, policies are important. Public policy is a lever of change, and the NDCs and other policies is an opportunity for governments to integrate climate action and nutrition. Uh, now, over to you, uh, Ms. Sadafe. You you shared very good insights about um, how waste can be utilized for nutrition. And I, I will I will start with a question that was posted in the chat. With, with dairy being an example, what has been the acceptability of these products and how can we scale this intervention to other products and other value chains that, uh, that, that has waste and we can utilize the waste for nutrition? Over yeah, to you, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is a new product in the market and uh, um, not available uh, so far. Uh, so we held uh, about three uh, testing feedback sessions and we held the testing with the children and the adult population. So uh, after every test, we improved the recipe in collaboration with our international partner and the local dairies engaged with. So in the last uh, uh, acceptability test, we distributed the samples among the 300 students of our school and very positive results we got from that. So. Um, now this is, I think, in our environment, we have formulated the recipe as per the taste profile of the population. So coming to the second question, that um, scalability point of view, yes. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, that there is a, a large potential to work on the dairy industry. And most of the dairies who are manufacturing teas are just wasting it. Even uh, one of the well-established dairy uh, who is capturing the 46% market share in the cheese production, is wasting it and not using it effectively. So there is a large potential to engage those dairies to convert this waste into a, and to develop a new revenue stream for for them. So and, and this is very interesting. And I think uh, we we do understand that uh, there is no one size fits for all. So we are providing the customized solution and recipes in collaboration with our international partners as per the capacity, ingredients, and equipments of the dairies that they have. So it is very easy for the dairies to adopt the solution. And uh, uh, I would also like to mention that this project is also implementing in two other countries like Tanzania and Ethiopia. And we also received some interest from there is there that they are interesting to convert this way water into a nutritious and healthy drink. So overall, the project has the potential to scale up and replicate in Pakistan and in other countries with the thriving dairy industry offering a sustainable solution with affordable price and high nutrient content. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sadaf. I, I hear you say that um, when it comes to formulation and acceptability and solutions generally, there's a need to continuously improve any solution that we we um, get to. And secondly, they need to engage 
the private sector. I also hear you talk about col uh, collaboration across borders to share solutions and scale up. Thank you very much. Uh, now, finally, I'll turn to you, um, Ms. Chawinga. You've you shared about the ERAS program and several successes. It's impressive to hear that diet, diet diversity doubled from 23% to 43%. Um, so I'm curious to know, how have you worked with the government on, on the ERAS program? And what are the challenges with scaling up agroecological practices at a national level? Ms. Chawinga. Ms. Chawinga, are you with us? Hearing, that is normally... Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. The, the first challenge that the, the, we are facing is the, the provision of resources. Because uh, these, these uh, climate uh, conservation activities, uh, they need heavy investments and also to uh, 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 putting them together with nutrition activities that they need uh, a lot of resources. So to have these uh, uh, activities being done uh, together or simultaneously, it requires a lot of resources. But the good thing is that the, the, the support from both the farmers and also the extension workers, since the farmers have, uh, have experienced the effects of climate change, and also they have seen how they, they, they uh, the pirate has has uh, successively helped the farmers in the in in uh, in upscaling their nutrition status and also in upscaling their livelihoods. They are willing to take part, but this is the only uh, limiting factor to say they need heavy investments. They need uh, a, a, a lot of resources so that we, you can uh, ably conduct them and also you can make impact in the people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Awinga. So I've identified a couple of themes here. Uh, we've seen government ownership, the policy environment. We've also seen um, proof of concept, as we've seen in Malawi, and the need to back this concept with investment. And I also hear you talk about the need to collaborate uh, across countries, but also in the local setting, partnering with smallholder farmers, private sector, and that's what we, we all need to scale the solutions that work. So I want to thank you all, our panelists, for participating in this brief session. And I hope this very brief, brief conversation provides information on the different examples, challenges, and opportunities for us to integrate nutrition and climate action. I'll turn it back to you, Dominic, and please, our panelists, if there are questions in the chat, feel free to answer them. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian, for, for facilitating this brief, but yet very informative uh, discussion and for helping indeed to, to extract uh, some recommendations that will, be, uh, that will be captured in the summary that will be made available later on. I will now give the floor to Dr. Luis uh, Maria de Riguil, the head of the multi-sectoral action in the food system unit of WHO for some concluding remarks. Uh, Luz, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly all the session has been a very, very good. So um, I appreciate a lot the invitation and the opportunity just to give a couple of uh, points regarding what WHO is doing in this space. Um, first, I would say that this webinar gave us opportunity to uh, everyone, to all the audience, to have more clarity on the links and interdependence between climate change and nutrition. And of course, uh, I think that now everyone leaves uh, this uh, webinar with uh, clarity on ICANN. ICANN is an initiative uh, that brings together all this narrative and certainly there is collective action uh, around it and, and hopefully there will be a lot of impact uh, with it. Uh, so WHO continues to work on highlighting the win-win uh, between uh, climate action and nutrition and is doing so through a series of events uh, in the road towards a COP28. Uh, with our partners, we are organizing a workshop on 2nd of May, uh, with a number uh, of permanent missions partners uh, and the missions are from Rome and Geneva which uh, gives a lot of uh, 
strength to these uh, com uh, conversations. Uh, then after that, there will be a, a side event uh, around the World Health Assembly, number, uh, number 76. Uh, WHO is convening that side event in collaboration with GAIN, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, and FAO, of course. Uh, so if there are representatives of member states, uh, please contact us. Uh, because if, they, if you would like to co-sponsor the event, this is the right time. We are finalizing the concept note and all, all the proposal together. As, as we heard today from the examples uh, from Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Pakistan, uh, there are concrete examples on where we can bring together the narrative between nutrition and uh, climate change. Um, it's clear that some countries uh, are taking actions uh, and very concrete actions to bridge the gap between climate uh, and nutrition action. And we need more of those examples. But uh, it's not only more, it's about reporting those examples. Uh, we need to document them. We need to discuss them as we are doing today. But also we need to ensure that they are included in the reporting uh, of the food systems transformation. The reporting template has been shared with the national conveners uh, uh, by the food, system, uh, food Systems Coordination Hall that uh, WHO and FAO support. Uh, the reports uh, and good examples will feed into the stock taking moment uh, after the uh, Food Systems Summit, uh, which will take place uh, on the 24th and 26th of July in Rome. So, Reporting is critical, otherwise it's very difficult to keep us accountable and keep learning from each other. Um, I want to change, uh, I want to take the opportunity to mention uh, the link uh, that nutrition climate change have with food safety. It's not only a link, it's a, a, a really a connecting thread. A climate change poses a real change and is highly relevant driver of existing and emerging food safety risks. Increasing temperatures that cause a ocean warming and acidification, severe droughts, wildfires, a wildfires a precipitation patterns that are changed, melting glaciers, a raising sea levels, and extreme weather are a changing our food systems, are negatively affecting our food systems. And some of those uh, conditions are resulting, uh, resulting in an increased risk uh, and emergence of, uh, of, existing of, uh, an, of existing and new foodborne pathogens and parasites. Uh, there is also an increase of, uh, in the incidence of um, harmful uh, algal blooms, uh, increase of mycotoxins and of heavy metals, uh, particularly methylmercury uh, in the environment. So, the connections between nutrition, food safety, and climate change are very, very tight. Uh, and we are highlighting that, the WHO is highlighting that in the uh, WHO Global Strategy for Food Safety 2022-2030, uh, which was launched uh, um, last year. So it's very important that uh, food safety is also integrated into interventions and commitments for fly, uh, ch uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. And maybe some of you have heard about the One Health approach. We need to use the One Health approach. It refers, a, it is an integrated, a unifying approach that aims to sustainable, a sustainably balance and optimize health for people, animal, and ecosystems. And WHO is hosting a, an initiative that brings together the different organizations a, to have joint planning to ensure that we are always thinking about how uh, we can address people, animals, and, and, and the planet in our uh, programming and actions. Uh, this approach, the One Health approach, recognizes the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants, and wider, and wider environment, uh, including the ecosystems. Um, this approach uh, mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities. Uh, I mean, throughout the community and really putting the health at the center, the health of everyone at the center. So before I end, a, I have here in my notes a, a quote that I would like to share with you is by Dr. Tedros, the WHO's Director General. 
And, and he, he said, uh, the bi bidirectional relationship between nutrition and climate change is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. It means that by ensuring healthy diets from sustainable and resilient food systems, we can address all forms of malnutrition, as well as mitigate climate change. This is why for me, the initiative of, on, on climate action and nutrition is almost too good to be true. I close the quote. It's true. Uh, there are so many wins uh, by bringing together nutrition and climate change that it is true that it's almost too good to be true. Uh, I believe that today our audience lives with more clarity on the connections between nutrition and climate change and on the systemic actions that we need to take to improve the health of people, animals, and the planet. From WHO, I, I can certainly say that we look forward to our collective action in this area. Thank you, and over, uh, over to you, Dominic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luz, including for the quotes of Dr. Tedros, an excellent one. Uh, well, colleagues, as you know, in this dialogue series, we are committed to identifying and sharing the key lessons that are emerging. And therefore, as, for, as I said, for the, as for the previous dialogues, we will extract some key takeaways, messages, and preliminary conclusions from this discussion and propose them to you at the beginning of our next webinar. And I would like, of course, to express our sincere gratitude to all the distinguished speakers who dedicated their valuable time to be with us today. I would like especially to thank our Geneva partners, uh, WHO, GAIN, and SUN, and our colleagues, of course, in the FAO uh, Food and uh, Nutrition Division, and of course, in the, the Brussels and uh, Geneva office. Last but not least, our gratitude goes to the participants for taking your time to join us in this uh, seventh event of the FAO in Geneva Nutrition Dialogue Series. And I thank you for your attendance and please do join us for our next webinar. It will be more and more interesting. Uh, thank you, good day and bye-bye. Thank you, bye Dominic. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Dominic. Bye-bye, bye-bye.